18. Did, is everybody on page 18? On page 18? Okay, good. Um, and I know we did exercise one together in class. Exercise two. Did anybody have trouble doing this? Was it hard to find ways of writing on these words? Any thoughts? Any? What I want to do then is, I'm going to say that this primarily the writing exercise isn't what I'm mostly worried about for us. Mostly it's, as we had said earlier, the, the reading stuff. So what I want to do is I want to start where things are getting a little bit more intense. And let's begin where it says uh, line, section four. And now we're going to each do a whole line by ourselves. And everybody just sort of follow along. Yes, it is. Is it number four? Can I just ask a question on section three? Ah, yes. Okay, okay. let's do three out loud. Line B, the very last word. Why does that line have a question Line B, the very last. I think that's a smudge on your paper. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a good question. I think it's a little schmutz. <laughs> <laughs> Take your race. Right. So I'm looking at yours, and yes, you do have a paper. I mean, it's there. It's Thank you. 
And something is happening, especially when we do a whole line like this. What I think is happening inside a race is the following. You know what you're going to read. So some of you pre-sounded out the line and then read it again. So you're doing two kinds of reading now. You're doing syllable by syllable, but then you're also in your brain and eyes are now doing this. They're grabbing the whole word. Do you see how if you sound it out syllable by syllable, it's like when a child sounds out syllable by syllable versus whole word reading? You're starting to do that. Could you hear that? How like you're reading a cluster of concept, a cluster of syllables together. That's wonderful. That's week three you're doing that. I'm very proud of you. Now we're going to keep on pushing on. Good, good, good. Now we're coming to lesson three. So this, you have already learned, we're on the top of page 20, you've already learned a shin, a bet, a ta, a lamen, a mem, and a final mem. Okay. And these are all the vowels you've learned. Two that make an ah sound and two that make an o sound. And you've learned shalom and shabbat. And you've also learned the roots of what those three uh, consonants make together. So the thought of wholeness or completeness with shin, lam, and mem, and resting or desisting and labor with shin, bed, ta. Now we're going to learn two other ones. They are easy because their sound is easy, but I'm going to tell you it is. They're tricky because now your eyes, your eyes and brain to learn a new skill set. How to make teeny tiny distinctions. So many of our English letters we think look very, very different from each other. And my younger students, when they start to have, study Hebrew letters, think they look very similar. But it's probably just what we grew up with. So that first letter is called a He, and it makes an H sound. And we talk a little bit about when it's at the end of a word, how the H at the end of the word would be the difference of spell spelling Sarah, S-A-R-A, versus S-A-R-A-H. We know Sarah's is spelled in it both, both ways, but it's pronounced the same. So when he is at the very end of a word, you don't, <laughs> you don't do that. Um, uh, but when it's in the middle or at the front of the word, it sounds just like an H. The next one is a rash, and it's making an R sound. Depending on where your parents are from or what part of Israel you're in, it may sound a little bit different than just a straight R. Some, if you listen to Israeli speak, sometimes it sounds almost a little bit further back in their throat. Not really guttural, but and, and sometimes when I'm speaking Israel, I notice that I move my R a little bit further back in my throat. But you'll pick up these nuances. For us, it's fine if we pronounce it like R as in Vogue. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 um, It's interesting to me that Japanese don't hear the difference between R's and L's. So if you go rice, lice, do you see how your mouth is kind of the same, but then your tongue's in a different place? So it's like that. Like we get used to sound, oh, how could you confuse an R and an L? So like two different things. It just depends on what you wear. You know what I mean? So for this R, I think it's fine if we go close to a parent and R. We'll be fine. Okay, so now, so you see what the challenge is for this week. It's now an I challenge. It, it's not going to be a sound challenge. So let's start with the saying the letter. Again, these will be helpful because the name of the letter is the sound in this case. Can you read the book with you? Okay, good. So let's start on line A on the bottom of page 20. Yeah, and you can say its name. Oh, no, it's the same about the sounds. The sounds. Okay, good. So that's good. Do you 
And in Hebrew it's called Shva, and it's, it's a little vowel that means don't make a vowel sound here, <laughs> make a consonant sound. And we're going to get to that, we're not to it yet. So even if it's going to sound like no vowel, it needs a, a orthographic mark to tell you that. So you're, you're, it's a process of elimination, it must then be kind of an argument. And your brain will make that argument very, very quickly. You know, maybe you'll do that very fast. Now, let's, this is one of the class's favorite topics, dots. <laughs> dots often appear in Hebrew letters and serve various grammatical functions. That is itself is confusing because there's one dot can be doing different jobs, so it's a little confusing. In most cases, the dots do not affect the pronunciation of the word. Sometimes their job is to do that job, they're just saying. There are, however, three Hebrew letters whose pronunciation is altered by the appearance of a dot in the letter. Okay, so let's just unpack that for a second. So we're talking about a consonant that three times will change if the dot is inside the letter, as opposed to on the top, on the bottom, on the side of One of these, we already learned, is bet, which has a different sound when it's written without the dot. You will learn more about these letters in later chapters. From this point on, uh, the reading practice and exercise is will with some letters with dots that do not affect the pronunciation. What does that mean? What that means is, look at the word Torah on the next line. Ta, it has the O sound, the <coughs> word K, but there's a dot in the middle of the ta. That happens sometimes. <laughs> it just happens. It just happens. Sometimes it snows in October. It just happens. <laughs> Does everybody understand? 
So all the commentaries. So some people call this together Torah. Okay. Sometimes it'll just seem to be oral and written Torah. Then beyond that, it can be all um, all scripture, all like sacred stuff. So it can be Tanakh. Some people refer to Torah as Tanakh. Tanakh is an acronym of T N N Chasa, which is Torah, meaning the first five books of the Bible, which is the Book of Prophets. Ketuvim, uh, which is all of uh, like Ecclesiastes and other scriptures. But some people will call Torah all of this. And then in the Bible, in the, in the Torah itself, when we see the word Torah, it can mean any kind of teaching or instruction or rules. So all... Instructions, etc. So you can see why just that one word Torah can be very confusing itself. So it's in its context that we know what people are actually talking about when they say the word Torah. Yeah, just digress a little bit on that. It doesn't have to be. Just maybe I just want to hear people say that. Is that helpful to understand? Thank <laughs> you. Um, okay, good. So now, enough about that. Um, the word Torah can be used in your sacred literature, and the study of Torah is an avenue for interaction with others. Notice that in the following quote from the Talmud, the word Torah has a prefix attached. Who can see the word Torah in here with a prefix? Yeah. Does everybody see that? And what is the prefix? Ha. So you can actually read that whole word. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if they're doing it in this section. Let's see if they're going to say it again. But yeah, they're going to talk about that. Okay. So, in all of these cases, what the word Torah has in common is this quote that, uh, that the Talmud is bringing. Torah knowledge is not gained except in the company of others. The engagement of Torah is uh, um, understood to be interactive, either with like, other people or between God, and it's not um, rote memorization. That it's, it, it's an engagement. And the verb that goes with what you do with Torah, in all meanings of Torah, is that one of the words you'll see is limot, to study. But another word, and that's the word used in the prayer before you start to study Torah, is la'aso, which means to actually busy yourself with. So it's a kind of a slightly different nuance than just, um, just study. Okay, now we're going to go back to language. We just do a little digression here. Okay, now we're going to talk about vowels. In this chapter, we introduce three new vowel symbols, two of which are written beneath the Hebrew letter, and the third vowel is written with symbols both beneath the Hebrew letter and to the left. <coughs> so, the first one is E, as in what we want to say here, as in E. Now things are going to start to get a little confusing because your brain's maybe thinking of E's and long vowels and short vowels. Um, so here we go. It's going to be three dots underneath, kind of in a little triangle shape. That makes the F sound. The next one is, and we're going to talk about the note because this is important, a vowel that is two dots and it sounds like A as in play. And the next one is A as in play, but it's got two dots, and a little U up here. So these are the three things. I want to jump to the note on the next page. The Sephardic Hebrew has some variation in pronunciation. We talked about some of the variation with the consonant. Excuse me. Now we're going to talk about variation with some of the vowels. The Sephardic Hebrew has some variation in pronunciation. One variation concerns the pronunciation of the vowel, this one right here. In North America, this vowel is generally treated as identical to the sound <coughs> of this. So these two are treated exactly the same. In Israel, however, this vowel is often pronounced like this. <laughs> What's interesting is, for me personally, it's one of uh, the things that, oh, so my pronunciation is definitely Sephardic, but every once in a while, this I'll pronounce more like this. I think it's going to be I was such, so, so young when I first started to study. That one I can't change ever. So, do you, do you see what I'm saying? So, if you are, it's the question of what should this sound like? Should it sound like this? Or should it sound like this? That's the question. That's what we're talking about. And should, in short, should it sound like, like bed, like eh? Or should it sound like a? Does everyone know what the 
impression is. So if you're going by um, sort of, no, they're saying North American, I would even say Ashkenaz, then it's like that. I think it's kind of all yeah. Yeah, yeah. Except for if you're like a yeshiva student. 
And your teacher is somebody who is a descendant from somebody who got out of Poland or Russia or whatever, and they kept the, they kept that pronunciation alive. But nobody's learning that, like in public school in Israel. Nobody's learning it in, in the religious schools in North America. Nobody's learning that. It's just little pockets that keep that pronunciation alive. The only time you hear that is we uh, just had we had two minutes yesterday, and one of the aliyahs was an older gentleman, uh, a grandfather, who definitely had this pronunciation. But when he dies, there'll be nobody. His, his son got up from Leah and his grandson was doing the bar mitzvah. They were all pronouncing it this way. So when he dies, this won't be carried forward anymore. So is that good or is that bad? It's for, for me, as a foot on each side, I'm hearing. <coughs> <coughs> so, so it's, so that's, that is a long answer. So we, except for pockets of very, um, really like um, uh, yeshiva-ish, you're not,
first one too, right? Yeah, yeah let's go back. Let's go back. If we're going to all do the A sound, let's try that again. Okay, so. Tame? Yeah. No, no, no. Tame. The, the class is, is, is asking you to go back to the very first one. <laughs> There's an uprising here. <laughs>
draw the sound. Do you see how that's mm -hmm. the case? Mm -hmm. Whereas if there was a shin at the end or a tog at the end, it wouldn't have that same thing. Right. 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 And it has to do with where the sort of consonants are produced in your Modify like Elohim, they'll say Elohim. 
They'll do everything just to, again, to push it back a little bit, push it back. Don't, you know, never forget to get too close to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs>
you don't say you would maybe if, some, if someone said I'm sure it trust, you'd probably not invite them to your apple. Exactly. <laughs> you'd probably not invite them to your home for sure. That's exactly right. That's exactly what it, it means. They would also live close enough to the temple where they could walk. Exactly, exactly. So if you were a real estate agent and uh, you were talking to people, that's what it does. It means something linguistically, but it also means something uh, conceptual. So anyway, that's a Shomer Shabbos. And you can see the strong uh, influence of the Ashkenaz pronunciation. Shabbat is with the top going to an S sound, and the accent is on the first syllable, not the last syllable. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, this concept of Gordian is so interesting. The following are all examples of Hebrew words that come from Shin Mem Reish. This book has not yet introduced all the letters and vowels. Nonetheless, you can see the Shin Mem Reish. Uh, where there's been different vowels and prefixes and suffixes. What's interesting is the notion of how roots can influence meaning. So a bard or a keeper is a shomer. A bard is shmira. A watch or a shift is mishmer. A guard or post is mishmar. <coughs> and that's the name of one of the kids. Conservative, conserving, or preservative is mishamer. Conserve tin or can't, so you might say like canned fruit, is mishumar. Barded, reserved, or restricted is shamor. Oh, is that C? <coughs> no, it's shamor. It's, it's taken. It was a taken, but it was a guardian of my friend. That's what it means. Um, shamor, uh, Samaria. So what is the garden? Aha! What, what is what, what is what part? Samaria. Ah, well, think about it. Where is where is Samaria located? Over in the west. Yeah, and what's right underneath it? Where you come into? It's south of Jerusalem, right? It's it's a, a little bit beside, but it's above Jerusalem. Oh, so it, you're sort of guarding the guard. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And Hashomer Hatsayir, <coughs> the name of Isaiah's youth group, literally the young guard. So, so it has a sense of physical guarding, but it also has a, a sense of conserving, preserving, um, in a technical, a very technical way. Guarding pairs or something are guarding or preserved. Uh, but it also means, um, can mean spiritual guarding as well. Um, but it also, is it also like a, if you said someone was guarded emotionally or? Personality wise, would that no, be? No, no. The, the roots that are used for that are clothes. They, they don't associate that with guarding, but more with clothes. Yeah, yeah. But um, the, the tradition of after a person dies or before they're interred, that piece there, where you have somebody sit with them, that's also this one. So you're not like, like nobody's going to take a practice, but you're guarding over that kind of sense. You know what I'm saying? So it has, it's a very, I think it, to me it's very, it's very beautiful. The following are prayer book excerpts containing Shin Ben Reish, you may already be familiar with it. <coughs> Let's look at, at La Chadrati, the first one, and see if you can see the one place where it shows up. Children up with right hands on their 
open art. Who can see here where it comes in? Third word. Third word. Third word. Third word. Yes. Yivarecha alai v'yishmerecha. May God bless you and keep you. What's interesting, if you think of the, all the nuances of keep versus guard, it's a very interesting the difference of what's actually happening, what we assume the relationship is. Anyway, now we're talking about all this writing business. Um, I would like to just do a couple of seconds on writing, but I'm more like a human being is what I want to do. And I'll give you this other uh, writing stuff as a homework. But let's, just because I know for some people uh, the writing is good, Look at the, basically the way these are written, what makes them in script versus print is a softening. So the hay is going to be one, two, three. One, two, Because it carries on the 
God's name and all of that. And it's, it's uh, I think that was, it adds another layer to what we were talking about.